I'm sure you're familiar then also with the symposium, right? Where they go around the table telling their stories of what they, how they understand love. Aristophanes' version is that we started out as humans, two heads, four arms, four legs, back to back, and that the gods split us in half. And some of those pairings were male-female, some were female-female, some were male-male. Eunuchs in the post-gender Jesus, because it's really important. I've had so many people say, no, when Jesus referenced eunuchs, he's talking about celibacy. I'm like, yeah, that doesn't make any sense in the first century context. It means absolutely no sense. What is true, by the way, is that bishops in the fourth century made a clear shift to claiming that, that this is a reference to celibacy. But in the first century, whether or not Jesus said it, I don't care. In the first century, there's no one who's going to believe that someone being a eunuch means that they are celibate. Some Pharisees came to him and to test him, they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause? What they're really asking is, for which which reason for divorce are you okay with? Hillel or Shammai, they're the two primary camps, which then, if you know what's going on in the, in the context, this is a debate that is well established by the time these Pharisees approach Jesus with this question. He's not saying anything new. The word being used is to reference a dress worn by daughters of a king. And so there's a reference to Tamar, ripping hers after she's raped, right? And then there's a reference to this in Genesis. And so given to a son. Dr. Jennifer Grace Bird. PhD from Vanderbilt University and Master of Divinity at Princeton. Dr. Bird has taught at Hollins University and University at Portland. Her background within the United Methodist Church Education and Presbyterian Affiliated Institution, more than a decade spent in several ministerial contexts, six years of graduate work in biblical studies, and more than 25 years of teaching in classrooms of all kinds, informs her approach to having quite honest and sometimes difficult conversations about what is actually to be found in the scriptures of the Christian Bible. Her latest book, Marriage in the Bible, What Do the Texts Say?, is going to be the center of today's discussion. Check out the links in the description. She also has her own channel and check out her other books as well. Let's get right into the discussion. Welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis, and I'm with Dr. Jennifer Bird, as we have just shown in the uh, introduction there. And uh, by the way, links are in the description for those books. Check those out. And um, we're going to talk about your latest marriage in the Bible. Yeah. And it's a great- What do the text say? What do the text say? What do they say? And that's what my channel really, my audience and people that like watch my channel we're all about the text yeah. we want to know what do the text say what's yeah, in that's text? awesome this is a perfect yeah. audience then for what it is i'm doing you know yeah it is so i want to start with um we'll go back what we'll do is i want to start with in the old testament and deuteronomy what are some of the things that it's going on in marriage i mean if you want to start with adam and eve is there a marriage there i know you wrote, wrote about that in the book as well maybe we could start there actually and then we'll go on to, we'll like so we'll sort of go through time and we'll go to do the <laughs> Go to the New Testament, and then we'll 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 end there. So let's start with Adam and Eve. What's going on with Adam and Eve? Is that is that our marriage? What's going on with this? Yeah, yeah. There are two pieces to that. My response to that one is to talk about what it actually is doing, and the other is to acknowledge why people think it's they're married. So let's do that part first, shall we? Sure. Um, and and this is the thing. Um, the it was pretty significant for me when I first realized this because of it changed one little word instead of saying that, that, you know, he, uh, he leaves his parents and clings to his wife, it should really say, if we want to be honest about the Hebrew there, it should say he clings to, you know, he leaves his parents and clings to his woman and the two become one flesh. When I first like, like embraced this way of reading it, it dramatically changed something for me. And I can tell you it has dramatically changed things for my students and in-person classes where they're just like, what? Now, what? Are so you, let's talk about it. Yeah, go ahead. You're talking about the he, the way the Hebrew wording is, like Isha, means, yes. and, and that's, okay, interesting. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So you have, you know, like Genesis 2 is a separate story from 1 or whatever, starting in verse 4. And yeah, the first human created is Adam, which is a generic human, not a male. And Right. Right. And so that the misleading starts in verse 7 of that chapter because we're taught to think that's a guy. 
but that it could be androgy- uh, it could androgynous. Be, I think androgynous. is a better way. Yeah, yeah, I think it's better to think of it that way. And, and, which here's the, here's the thing about that: in the Orphic mysteries, very old, very old, ancient Greek, even some historians say there's like echoes of even before pre-Hellenic stuff getting ta- passed down into into the Orphic mysteries. Their primordial god, who cr- is created from the abyss, is is Thanes, who is a male and female. So you have this idea of this first creation mm-hmm. and um, being male and female. And I and I'm wondering. And I, now this is just a whole. I just t- derailed everything. It was, it's fine. Let's do it. But I just wanted to point that out. It's like Adam being in the beginning is the first creation, and he's androgynous. It and I like to call it it instead of he because people the he means a lot to us, sure, you know. Sure, sure. And you know, the, you, I'm sure you're familiar then also with the symposium, right, where they go around the table telling their stories of what they how they understand love, and um, Aristophanes's version is that we started out as humans, uh, two heads, four arms, four legs, back to back, and that the gods split us in half. And some of those twos, some of those pairings were male, female, some were female, female, some were male, male. I about that. That's yeah, so yeah, yeah. Crazy. So this it's must not have been a universal idea. Right, right, right. I mean, you can see why people might play around with that idea, right? Yeah. So I think that's a, a helpful way to think about that first human, however you want to depict, you know, if you were to draw it, that's another, that's another question. But for me, I try to think of it as androgynous. But it's also amazing how they got it right in a way, because um, evolution sh- evolution says that you know all life was um, at one point. Uh, what do you, what's the word? is it androgynous? But isn't there is another hermaphroditic, right? Hermaphroditic. Yeah. So I it's like I don't know if they guessed that or how they figured. That's a cool. <laughs> it's it's a cool it, image. It, it reminds me of the Hindus uh, who predicted. Are they like? have a number on how old the earth is and they're like close to like what mm-hmm. science like they're mm-hmm. not like on they're like off by like a billion years but still like compared to six closer thousand, to four thousand years yeah. old <laughs> <laughs> but like this is one of those things then thales thales the philosopher is like we all came from water yeah it turned out turned out we did come not from so far off yeah so yeah how these people are guessing some guessing some right stuff right it's fascinating isn't it it is yeah so I think we should understand that first story, right? There's a human that's created and God says, sees that that human is alone. And that's the issue in that story, right? Is in chapter two is this, this desire that most humans, not all, but most have for like pairing up, right? And so how do we find a partner for this? And my translation of that in, of the Hebrew is an equal as its partner or partner as its equal instead of a help, some part, something that de- designates a lower status person, right? Someone who's subservient, which is how most English translations tend. But anyway, we're so focusing on this. So the the first human is just there and needs a partner. And so that's, therefore the animals will come through and then God creates, you know, puts the human to sleep, pulls something out of its side. So we've got two little bodies here, the first, you know, that he's playing with. And now we have male and female. And yes, that is when in the Hebrew, we have ish for man and isha for woman. And they're not actually related etymologically speaking. It just sounds like they are. And so in d- verse 23, you know, at last, this is flesh of my flesh, blood of my bone, she shall be called woman for out of, she shall be called woman, Isha, for out of man, Ish, she was taken. Verse 24, therefore, <laughs> a man shall leave his father and mother and cling to his woman and the two shall become one flesh. It's still the same Isha and Isha as we had in verse 23. Every single English translation will will say man and woman in verse 23. And I have yet to, there's only one English translation out of the 50 I've consulted that doesn't imply married status in verse 24. And 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 that conforms best to the Hebrew, right? Say that again. And that's the one that conforms best to what the Hebrew is saying. Well, yes, that's the um, the Jewish uh, just transliteration. They didn't actually translate it. <laughs> they just, yeah, they just decided because it's so not, contentious. Wow. Yeah, they just transliterated just that word in that phrase. So they don't actually make a decision on it. Right. So and that's how it falls down. Right. And it's because in that next part of the verse, it says, that you, I'm assuming, right? It says that the two become one flesh, right? So there's an implication that they're going to have sex. So we better well get, we better get them married before they have sex, right? I mean, that's our current or modern understandings influencing how the committee decides to translate something. And so in the Hebrew, 
Bible. So in the First Testament, there isn't there aren't nouns to differentiate between a woman or a man pre-marriage in our terms and then their status now that they are married. So I have a chart in the book, you know, like, well, we have lots of ways to refer to someone who's single, male or female, right? Right. And we have ways to designate a difference. They didn't. So there's no so, Mrs. Mr. There's no <laughs> there's no that there's no title. And then, you know, we say bachelor or bachelorette, you know, and we, you know, and wife and husband and wife. They didn't have a way to differentiate. He was an Ish before he purchases a woman. He's an Ish after she's an Isha before and she's an Isha after. So, you know, there's a lot of things you can take from that. One, I think, is just that differentiation wasn't important yet in their eyes. Right. It's it makes me think. Because um, in the pagan marriage, there was a you get a title. The man would get Guy Gaius, and the woman would get Gaia. Okay, so you're both becoming the Earth, right? Yeah. Kind of interesting. There is a title thing there, and it makes you think: if it's not coming from the Hebrew Bible, are they looking around at other different stuff going around and saying, "Oh, maybe we should have our own version of this"? Well, yeah, and I I don't know how early the Gaia Gaia Me either. I have no idea. Mary comes in, but I would yeah. say that it might not even have been influenced by you know the um, the Hebrew people's decisions. No, that's what I'm, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. We have it's, yeah. it's totally in its, it's own not, category. It's not from that. Yeah, right. right. I'm saying. Yeah. yeah sorry, my, I'm what saying. I'm saying, and what I'm saying is, the, if the Christians are doing that later on, and it's not coming from the Hebrew Bible, and then maybe they're looking at. It, Pagans. Oh, I'm sorry. I misunderstood. Yeah, right. Where are they getting that need? Why are they deciding to to go along with a different name? And this is a good question, right? I don't, I haven't looked into the historical texts to help see where that language initially shows up, right? I think that'd be kind of, I mean, I don't have the inkling to go look into that, to be honest, but I do think it would be interesting to see where it does show up initially. Sure. Um, yeah. So Genesis 2.24 is the is the one of the two verses that people in Christian traditions at least turn to to say sex before marriage is a sin because they get married before they have sex according to the way the translation reads not according to what the Hebrew says you know and to even reflect on the difference it makes when you start to read so I think for instance I think what would be more true to the texts both of the Hebrew Bible and the Newer Testament is if we removed all references to husband and wife because it's not in the Hebrew or the Greek. The same thing that goes along with husband and wife, like man and woman in Hebrew, and they're not being a different word to designate husband and wife. Sorry, what, what's the word? What, so where are they? How are they getting husband and wife from the <laughs> translation if it's not there? What's the word? What are, what are they translating there? Do you know? It's Yes, it's Ish and Isha. That's so man and woman. They're just taking it's man just and man and woman. It's Ish and Isha throughout the entire Hebrew Bible. There Wait, shouldn't be a reference to husband and wife. Is the is the Greek Septuagint have it that way? Too. So it's just his woman. It's Gune, his woman. And there you go. Kai Kai Esantai. But it is a. But I'm curious. I'm curious to how it, third it, century it, BC people or whatever. Sure, whatever sure, sure. They, yeah, I'm BC. Mm -hmm. How they interpret it because this would because then we know how the Christians interpret it. The Christians are using the Septuagint. Sure. Yes, Christians would be. Yes. So, that, but 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 this is actually proving to your point even more. We looked it up without even realizing it, just to check. Right. And right. the Septuagint has man or um, uh, woman. Right. If there is because if there isn't a Greek designation by the first century, it's certainly not going to be there three, you know, two and a half centuries earlier. Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah, this is even more um, convincing what you're saying. Wow. Right. We shouldn't use husband and wife, I don't think, because the, it's, not, we, not, it's not in the Hebrew, it's not in the Greek. So why is it right, in the English? Right. It's in the English because people are uncomfortable with people having sex and it not being clear that they're married. <laughs> Which is funny because technically speaking, in terms of the Hebrew Bible, having sex is how you know that a couple is married, but that only applies when the man wants it to. <laughs> So if he's having sex with other women, with women that he doesn't actually want to marry, that doesn't count. But the way that you know that a couple is married is he goes in and has sex to her. It's not something they do together. It's something a man is, is talked about as something a man does to the woman. And, and this actually becomes part of the part of the culture for the.
Christian world where yeah. when you would get a, when you get married to make sure the marriage was legit on their wedding night, he had to do his thing. And there was there were times and this is actually in um, the stories written about Pope. Uh, what's his name? Pope. Alexander from the late 15th century uh, where his daughter got married to the Schwarzva family, famous uh, family from, I can't remember which part of Italy or Spain or something. Mm -hmm. But anyways, this, there was a big deal because they had to, this marriage got canceled because they found out he was impotent. Mm -hmm. So like, this is not just the women who get affected by this. The males are pressure to do the thing. Like better get it done. Or you're going to be, and then he was the laughing stock of the whole world after that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is okay. this is my this is weird, mm -hmm. crazy. I'm sorry. This is no, like, and there's an early. I don't know how early the tradition starts to have a friend of the man of the groom stand outside the the room to listen for his crying out as he ejaculates. Right, the yeah. the cry of joy. Yeah, <laughs> so the joy. <laughs> now think about this. If somebody was listen, if somebody heard about, I'm just going to use an example: the Muslim world, just because it's familiar. If you heard this happening, if somebody in America heard about this happening in the Muslim world, they'd be like, they are so backwards. I can't believe it. Totally. But it's like we look at our own religion, culture and our past in, in, in Europe. And it's there's stuff that we would. It's only because it's us that we go. Oh, yeah, it's no, us. It's OK, it's normal. But if it's others, it's completely weird and crazy and nuts. And we get all yep. like yep. Phob phobias about it. Yep. Now, the reason why I'm pointing that up is because. A lot of this culture, a lot of this kind of patriarchal culture um, is sort of like, it's it's like, it's not even in, written, in, it's like implied. For example, yeah. when you wrote about Deuteronomy 24. Sure. Uh, yeah. We go that yet? Are we? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Deuteronomy 24 is strange passages <laughs> coming from the mouth of Moses telling people <laughs> if they get divorced, um, if you want, if a man wants to get a divorce, he can just do it. He just writes it off. He, he, he like needs it. to write a certificate. Yeah, of he divorce. Has to write yeah. It, it mm -hmm. has to be legally, which is kind of strange. Okay. But then the second person, this is a really strange passage. The second person is allowed to marry her. But then if he decides he doesn't like her, he can just write another thing. Mm -hmm. Then just the first her. person is not allowed to take her back again. Like, right. Because, because she's defiled. In, from his perspective, she's then defiled. Right. Because men <clears throat> having sex with a woman defiles her in terms of another man having sex with her but but you're i think part of what you're right raising is but that second guy was okay to have sex with her even though she'd been defiled by the first guy yeah yeah but so there you know i think that that particular law in terms of that not being able to take her back uh may have been an element of dis you know kind of trying to hedge against um dismissing for petty reasons which is what i think is happening in matthew 19 to a certain extent when jesus is debating with um, with Pharisees about that same issue is, you know, when they talk about, you know, divorce, th there's an issue of for which reason is it okay to divorce? Can you do it for just any reason you wish? Like she, she's a lousy cook. And I imagine, Neil, you've probably read some of those, um, given how widely read you are in terms of ancient texts, but there are, whether it's playful or not, there are references to that being a motive for divorce, that she's a lousy cook. And so, that's just too capricious, right? That's not fair, right? You to just divorce a woman for that reason, especially given how how tenuous her own status is in a patriarchal society and depending upon men, right, to for her survival. So the one in 24, Deuteronomy 24, right? You can, you know, it can't be a woman initiating. That's the first thing on that, I think that's important. But but yes, he can write a certificate, write it up. So, I mean, you know, kind of proof like, yep, I did do this. You know, we all know that you two have been married. So, are you, you know, need to make sure that it's legit for someone else to marry her kind of a thing. Um, someone else to take her, not marry. That's the other thing about the Hebrew Bible. There isn't a verb to marry either in the Hebrew Bible. There's there's predominantly it's the verb to take. And then there are a couple other ver verbs that are used that aren't as common, but they all have to do with treating a woman as property and as something that he is lording himself over. Um, so anyway, yeah, so the Deuteronomy 24 um, is, I don't think I'm as, what I, you know, what I care about in that is, it's just different than what I think you care about, um, which is fine, but I care about the issue of defiling and how sure. the language around sexuality for women is significantly based on her purity 
But people don't stop to think about the fact that the thing that makes her unpure to begin with is a man. Like, it's a man entering her. That's what makes her defiled. Like, you guys need to get over yourselves and your penises. And you know what I mean? Like, you really need to get over yourselves. But have you thought about the fact that it's a penis that defiles her? Like, stop denigrating your penis. <laughs> True. Okay. Stop doing point. that. But it's also, obviously, I say that playfully, it's also more about being first on the scene. Who wants used goods? But what a terrible way to talk about or think about sexuality, right? There's and of this, course, like, I'm sure you're familiar that purity culture of the last 30 years in particular has really picked up on that used goods idea, yeah, is which part, is very biblical, yeah, right? Yeah, let me let me say something about that. Okay. Because okay. I, I, people who follow me know I engage with the people from wide ranging points of views. Um, I talk to everybody um, and I've debated a lot. I've debated a lot of Orthodox Christians recently who are who some might consider like very far right wing, mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. bigoted. I mean, the one guy yeah. gave himself a nickname pop of fascist because he kept getting called fascist so much. He, so he's like, he's like, I'll just going to wear it like a badge. But right. He's the person I'm talking about. Well, he the people like him and others that are in this sort of um, this new rise of whatever you want to call it. I don't know, whatever mm -hmm. or orthodox. Uh, what do they call themselves? Or um, trad trads mm -hmm. or, or trads. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Tra traditional. traditional. Mm -hmm. They call themselves trads. Yeah. And they're, these people, they, they, they really are pushing for the idea that it's not only, not only do they want to outlaw gay marriage, they want to outlaw all secular marriage at all. If you're not a Christian, you shouldn't be married because Christianity owns marriage in their opinion. <laughs> And I brought this up. I go, before Christianity ever existed, right. pagans were getting married. Everyone right. was getting married. It right. didn't matter what you believed in. You can just go and get married. Right. And then basically, their argument is it's not that way anymore. We're a Christian nation, blah, 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 blah. When they, they want there to be a church that's in charge of marriage things. And then secular people can just say, uh, just fill out paperwork for a union uh, or something. Yeah, unions. Is, they just want to make. And it's like, okay, well, now we're just arguing over like what to call it. It's like, what's yeah. the. Yeah. But, you know, what I think is interesting about this, Neil, and, I, and by the way, good for you for engaging people beyond what you think, um, you know, so significantly and trying to do so um, respectfully, I'm sure. Um, that is an honest reading of biblical, not, well, the biblical, tr you know, texts, and it comes from Ephesians 5, 31 and 32, which I address in chapter four. But that that text becomes the foundation for sacramental language for the church. And so what I realized in researching for that chapter was how, how far my own thoughts used to go that align with this trad this guy, this fat, you know, this Papa fascist that, that, right. That we yeah. have something special here, right. We are Christians. And because Jesus is a part of the, the deal here in our belief system and marriage to, you know, the bride, the church is married to, to Christ in the same way that a man marries a woman, you know, all of that language and the participation of Christ into the marriage or God in the marriage, it's different than the way other religious people talk about it. And so we've got the thing and I believed that fully, that it was special. It was a qualitatively special, um, a better form of marriage because Christ was involved. Like it's and, and I hadn't interrogated that for myself very much until I started writing about it and trying to write about it from a from a neutral position to acknowledge what I used to believe. And then I realized for some people, it's going to sound like I'm being really rude and throwing people under the bus because this sounds ridiculous, but it was genuine. You yeah. know, like I really believed that. Well, and not even that long ago, <clears throat> less than 20 years ago, that was the normal. Even if you, even Democrats would say marriage is between a man and a woman and it's a religious thing. I mean, you can see that I'm not going to name any names. I don't, I'm not going to get political or talk politics, okay. but like. Yeah. You can find this stuff. You can go back not to less in the nineties, and that was the normal position, unless you were like a very far um progressive on the on that side. But even the center left people were like, Yeah, well, marriage is for Christians. So it wasn't even that long ago where most people thought that. And I, now now I think it's good. Now I think most people don't think that, which is good. Well, I would suggest that part of that is because is about those who are in political 
leadership positions true coming from a christian background even if they are politically progressive right that a lot of people who have fairly progressive social social you know frameworks are still going to a protestant church on sunday every sunday so sure. i think that's what that's about um but i you know i think and so i'm glad that that piece is shifting sure but sure. you're right this country was you know it, yeah i don't want to get into the establishment of this country either um in terms of the the founders beliefs and what they did or didn't believe in practice but sure there's it's a significantly christian informed and influenced culture that we live in this country is for sure right we still reference god at the you know the inaugurations so. <laughs> and even 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 to say something about that because a lot of people and myself included i've made videos about what the founding fathers believe a lot of them being deists a lot of them being very against the idea of church and state being mm. linked and having sure separate. the attempt of the, at that sure Right. But they knew that the people that they were rule or ruling or whatever. Sure. Yeah, um, leading. Mm -hmm. Leading work mostly Christian. And they're and then the, so the culture is still there. Rather mm -hmm. whether the people on top are like that or believe that or not, the culture, right. the people, right. the, the yep. normies of society, they're they were Christian mostly at that time. So the that, ones that they were thinking of for sure. And you had and you had local laws in the late eighteen hundreds, uh or early eighteen hundreds reflecting that. There was, sure. there was blasphemy laws. There was anti witchcraft laws. There was all that stuff was still there, mm -hmm. even though we were sort of trying to separate church and state. Mm -hmm. We didn't really fully do it. it still, mm -hmm. it's, there still was the, a little bit of a connection there. Yeah. Well, on a this is related to your comment, but it's in a realm that's more familiar to me. Um, the idea of talking about marriages and or what takes place in a marriage, right? and how we're going to legislate around that there were it wasn't until after the turn of this 21st century that some states in this country finally passed a law saying that it was possible for a man to rape his wife they were the state of tennessee was had brought this law up 15 years in a row before it passed and there were enough men in the legislature to shoot it down because she's my wife and i can do whatever i want so let's be clear about this those are men well trained by their biblical tradition right their biblical texts lead to that way of thinking about women as possessions and you can do whatever you want and i have quite literally neil just in the last couple of weeks have i've had some people comment on some of my videos I did a video on consent in the Bible, and I've had people say signing the marriage certificate is all the consent I need. Right. <laughs> like, and, 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 and here, now here's I want to. This needs to be. This needs to be said. I think because recently I've been I've been engaged with women who are traditional Catholics and Orthodox who want this or claim to be, want this. So mm -hmm. this That's is very well made. It's mostly. Let, let's be real. This is mostly a man thing. Yeah. But there are surprisingly, there are women who are, I just want to be a, at Thank home mm -hmm. and I want to have a man that's going to be yeah. the breadwinner and right. I'll, right. I'll, and I give him consent. That's fine. Yeah. That's fine. And that, that, is, was, that happens. That's actually, that actually my point in the debate. Under secularism, you're allowed to do that, but you can't tell other people they have to do that. Mm -hmm. I think that's sort of the, the medium between people who want that life and people who don't. Is that's what secularism provides is the option, mm -hmm. which is a big, you know, that's a big, big uh, O for that option. Like, <laughs> it's, it's, like let's be real here. Like, yeah. this is not, this is, I would say most women don't want that, right? I mean, I don't know. Right. I can't. There, exactly. That's the point. Some do, and some men want, want that and, you know, want that kind of a woman and they can find it and they often find each other, but often do not. <laughs> and so, yes. Um, it's the forcing it. It's the expectation that everybody wants to live up to the standard or according to these roles. That's the problem, in my opinion. Yeah. And the fact that we're then saying it's all connected to our authoritarian, our God, the God that we believe inspired these scriptures and so forth. And so on. Now, up until right now, we've been talking mostly Old Testament text. Hebrew Bible. Mm -hmm. but, but we're talking about Christians in this society. So I think we should go. What does Jesus say about this? <laughs> He's referencing to the author of Deuteronomy. Yes. Okay. So they say is Moses, but 
probably isn't because it's written way later and we don't even know if Moses exists. I don't even need to say who wrote it, you know, like right. the author of Deuteronomy, right? So, right. We're talking about, <laughs> we're actually talking but, about, yeah, go ahead. Jesus does say Moses said, he's he kind of like, he kind of like, you know, it's the author's, this is like part of the mythos of this. Yes. What, what, what we're talking about. Um, but what is, so Jesus kind of takes this, he, does he, is he going a step further? What is he doing here? Yeah, what's interesting to me is, so I just want to be clear for your listeners, there are, what got me, part of what got me into writing this book was um, watching people talk about biblical marriage and want to affirm a biblical marriage. I want my life to be blah, blah, blah. And when I sat down with someone very conservative who endorsed a biblical marriage stance, he, you know, he informed me, these are the four passages that we mean, and we might also mean some of these others, but these are the ones that are central. Genesis 128, the be fruitful, multiply. Um, Genesis 224, <laughs> they're married before they have sex. Uh, Matthew 19, four to six, which is just a segment of this exchange. The exchange goes from three to 12. Um, and then Matthew five, excuse me, Ephesians 5, 31 and 32. So yeah, in Matthew, um, it's Matthew chapter 19. And I'm going to look at it because I always want to make, I always get like disoriented about this. Um, the Some Pharisees came to him and to test him, they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause? What they're really asking is, for which which reason for divorce are you okay with? Hillel or Shammai, they're the two primary camps, which then, if you know what's going on in the, in the context, this is a debate that is well established by the time these Pharisees approach Jesus with this question. He's not He's not saying anything new until we get to verse nine. Can we wait? Do you know what Hillel? Because you're talking about Hillel the elder. Yeah, the yeah the rabbi the rabbis the Hillel just, and Shammai. Just people understand what we're talking about. We're talking about this famous rabbi who, by the way, one of his famous passages is "Treat people how you want to be treated." Yeah, I'm I'm paraphrasing. It might yeah, be something, yeah, yeah. but Torah. it's it's re- says, this is the whole Torah. Everything it else is commentary. It long predates Jesus, is your point? And I it's think. Wait, yeah, and that's my point. It's like yeah. Jesus coming after this. Yeah, it's not that revolutionary for Jesus. It's not to say something like that. No, and I, I don't but have the other guy I'm familiar with. I'm, the other guy is he more strict? Is that what you're? Is, it, is this what the dichotomy comes? Yeah, in? there's a dichotomy. The question is, and I can't remember who is what, but there, there's the question is, can you divorce for any reason? Like she's a bad cook, or does it have to be for legitimate reasons that we can all agree, such as the, the, someone? someone was unfaithful which would in that context is predominantly going to be that the perception that she was unfaithful but we're starting to get to the point where it could be either who was unfaithful so that's one small shift that takes place between the hebrew bible and newer testament but it's small in my opinion um so yes one group says for any reason just as long as you write a give her a certificate and the other group says no 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 we have to protect marriage isn't something to just dismiss so quickly right it's so amazing. Reason. It's so mind blowingly amazing to me that I'm hearing this plus 2,000 years ago, sort of like a right left discussion mm-hmm. paradigm mm-hmm. in this political sphere is happening. Mm-hmm. Even in this, it's, I don't know. I don't know why I'm so amazed by that. But it's well, cool, cool to but hear. it is but right. Famous, famous, amazing, well revered right. theologians of the time period are, right. are very, um, progressive in their thinking least open to considering options and alternatives yeah. yes considering the contexts some are yeah yeah what a concept right yeah. <laughs> that's another thing is um like talking to not only john kloppenborg but um hmm. uh nice. other people as well who have written about how the early christians were pretty progressive compared to other people there were some elements to it for sure yeah, yeah. and that yeah. became a pro- part of those right. that Somehow they went, they reverted back. Yeah, back yeah, yeah. The progressiveness w- was became a problem. And that, and part of the progressiveness was giving power and um, a voice to women and to enslaved peoples. That's a problem. And that is part of why you see the re the introduction of the references to the household code in the books of Colossians and Ephesians, first Peter. Yeah. You need to get back in place. <laughs> yeah. You oh. stepped out of your place. Yeah. Uh, anyways, so, I derailed you. So let's go back to this. Okay. Uh, yeah, Jesus, no, it's fine. Jesus these are interesting around. tangents. Yeah, yeah Jesus is coming around for this uh, dichotomy of how to do this marriage. So what does Jesus do now? 
what the reasons are for, yeah, which reason are you okay with for divorce? And he answered. And so this is where people quote, they start here as if this is Jesus's idea. He answered, have you not read that the one who made them at the beginning, quote, made them male and female, end quote, and for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his woman, my English says wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. And that's the section that people w are quoting and turning to as if this is Jesus's command and claim about divorce and marriage. So far, he has just engaging the debate. He's not said anything new. Right. right? He's and just what, saying the premise of yes, what he said. Precisely. And like yeah, the way the debates normal. have gone, right? Like you he start hasn't here. anything yet. Exactly. Yet. This is where this is how the debate progresses. And so then that's when they say, well, uh, they said to him, why then did Moses command us to give a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her? Right. And he said to them, it's because you were so hard hearted that Moses allowed you to divorce your women. My English says wife. But from the beginning, it was not so, which is also a very interesting claim to make. But you know what else is interesting about this? He doesn't say us. He says you. It's like, mm -hmm. like what oh, is totally. This is Matthew. Yeah. yeah. What does he not do? Like uh, the, the author is weird on that part. You would think he'd say because Moses didn't let us. But yes he's no. saying it's you. It's weird. It's just a weird thing. All it right, is weird, but it's also part of the rhetoric of Matthew, as sure. well as the rhetoric in the book of Acts, which is even worse. Separating the Christians from the Jews. Not already. Christians, the sect of Judaism that is doing oh, this thing. Oh, yes. From yes, the yes. rest of Judaism, right? We're still there still isn't a concept the thing called Christianity yet. Not right, really, right. not technically. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. yeah. Um, so that he said that because it but it was not from the beginning it was not so and here's what he does introduce it's new and then in verse 9 and then in verse 12 and i say to you so the Matthean jesus does this a lot right there's a jewish law that he's either engaging or you know in this case debating and he honors the jewish law and then he ratchets it up like one or five levels you know and i say to you whoever divorces his woman except for unchastity and marries another commits adultery and his disciples said, if such is the case of a man with his woman, English says wife, it is better not to marry. Um, and he said, I'm going to redirect, which is away from answering your comment, which is another way of saying he doesn't disagree with that. Like most Christians, I would, I would, I'm not a, bet, a betting person, but if I were, I'd put a lot of money on, <laughs> on the fact that most Christians do not realize that Jesus has is being attributed with this line that it might be better not to marry because of this concern about <laughs> being able to get out of it. And then he goes into the comments of, in verse um, in 11 and 12 that have to do with eunuchs and eunicism. So I do want to make sure we wrap up on the earlier part before we talk about eunuchs here. Yeah. Um, what I think is important, and this is this is where this is something new. You won't. I haven't seen another scholar publish on this yet, or make this comment yet in publication. When he says that in verse nine, whoever divorces his woman except for except for unchastity and marries another commits adultery, I do think he's trying to protect women or protect. You could say he's speaking positively about marriage, but more than that is he's he's perpetuating this Hebrew Bible view of women as property and that the, what's at the heart of the marriage relationship is a man's desire for that woman to be pure. By and, the way, go ahead. I just looked, I just had to look this up. Like okay. what's the Greek word you, being used for wife, but it's, it's on air and Gune is man and woman. It's the same. Gunaika. Yeah. Gunaika. Which, yeah. Which, which can be woman or wife. Correct. So there really is no word for this. It's the same thing that we went through over Isha and Isha. It's the same concept. It's just it is. It's the same thing now in the Greek. Say, now it's okay. I guess it's fine to translate it as wife, but why? Why not just keep it the word woman and then making it? It's the same thing that we talked about with the Hebrew right. Bible. So yeah. it really, it's not the right translation. Well, it isn't. I think it should say woman instead of wife. That's why I have these little signs. And I'm, these, and I'm looking. I'm looking. I have at these signs that I hold up when I do story time. My English says wife, but yeah. I say woman because I know in the Greek it says woman. Well, here's how I, if I, <laughs> and it's also in the. It also has to do with marrying, and it also has to do with husband. Okay. <laughs> Let me show. You, I want to show something. I want to show. Um, okay. 
So the word, let me share my screen. This, I love this website, Perseus Tufts. I had the um, founder on my channel once. Oh, nice. Um, the word's being used mostly for women. As you see, like down here, all these different examples for women, lady. That's a lot of examples, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah it's a wide range in terms of time. Then it, then it gives the secondary translation as spouse, wife. And it's very, a lot smaller in comparison. <laughs> But I'm noticing a lot of it's from the New Testament. It is. And my 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 response to this particular thing that we're looking at is that wife or spouse is our understanding. We make that distinction. That's what I'm, that's what I'm saying. The translation, the people are translating this as that. But look at Homer's the same person. Look, is it Odyssey, Iliad, Odyssey, Iliad. So and the Herodotus. same person, Homer, is using this word for woman. But it's also being translated as wife by this by different people. So really, you can make the argument based on all of this and and uh, this, this first, the primary translation of this word is woman. So, and the secondary is wife because we translate it that way. Correct. Now that that's a big deal. I think so. That's why I you, made be, sure to you, talk about it I, <laughs> extensively in my book. <laughs> No, it's not all about the marriage. It's just about man and woman coming together and and what that could mean. There's different ways. So to us imposing our ideas about marriage onto them is totally inappropriate. Yes, sure. That is. I I, I think you made that abundantly clear and i like demonstrated it in this so far. I mean, that's really good. Like the the language is clear. The Greek is clear. The Hebrew is clear. But the English changes all of a sudden. Yes. Translation committee members make a choice to be misleading about how raw the initial languages are. And the initial the King James. What's that? King James Bible just edits everything up to make it sound better. Well, I think, <laughs> I mean, sure. And that was the first one in, you know, like, sure, they are doing that. But I just want to be clear that. It's been happening for the last 500 years. Like it was, it's always been done that way. It's always been done there, that way. There are well-educated men and women who are sitting on the translation committees. And I know like half of them. And I've actually tried to contribute to how they were going to update the new revised standard version. Like I tried to have some, com you know, some influence on that. Like these are people in this year, last year, yeah. two years ago, who are still. Are they mostly Christians? Yes. Yeah, this is see, this is one thing that I've noticed that I'm I'm like I'm not gonna sit there and be like the mythicist and say there's a big conspiracy to make Jesus like I'm not going that far, but I will go a little bit with them and say, Yeah, I think you're right. There are some biases at play in biblical scholarship. I'm not even sure how to respond okay. to that. It's All right. entire, I, I no, it is absolutely the trouble. case. No, that's yeah, absolutely I, the I, case. Like there's so much you. gatekeeping. I'm glad you're you're pointing that out because it's very obvious to to most people. And I'm not I, I don't know everybody in those wor in those worlds like you do, but I've from what I can see, it's what it looks like. Absolutely. And, but, but, but I don't want to make it um, sound like I'm like anti Bible scholars because there's amazing Bible scholars. There's amazing. some important work happening for yeah. sure, and a lot of it is it has this back edge to it, and so you have to. I think there's an element of it's it's um it is it can be complicated to know your source to know who's right and it's why every you know it's why every student wants to know what i believe because they're not sure if they can trust what i'm saying to them well i get that right try to share enough of my story so they know that i'm not trying to um you know i'm not trying to tell them to leave their faith but yeah, there are a lot of really great biblical scholars, and some of them are really aware of their bias, um, and don't. And some of most are not. And there are plenty who are trying to address issues around race and gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, things like that, in terms of how we then translate with those things in mind. But honestly, Neil, I there's a there's one example that um, that. <laughs> That they reverted, like they went work. They when they updated the new NRSV, they actually made something less clear. And I mean, the whole the the I don't know if you're familiar with this. You know the the robe that the the garment that Jacob gives to his beloved favorite son Joseph. Do you know about this? Yeah, the, the coat of many colors. The coat, yeah, except it's katonic pasim. And what's interesting is, yes, it is the coat of many colors in 
We you, you and I talked about this before. You you mentioned it was have more. We? Okay. This so this is the article of clothing that women usually wear. It's right? an art. Yes, the word being used is to reference a dress worn by daughters of a king. And so there's a reference to Tamar you, ripping hers after she's raped, right? And then there's a reference to this in Genesis. And so given to a son. And so initially the the footnotes for the Genesis one in reference to Joseph, the footnotes by the translation committee saying, we're not sure what this Hebrew word means, but they're the same people who translate it in reference to Tamar and have no problem translating it as a dress worn by. He's the one getting picked on by his brothers too. Yes, really. he is. Very odd. Yeah, you're, you're, I... So it makes, thing, it makes things make a lot more sense if you read it that way, right? Yeah, his son, his father was fine with, you know, but but what's interesting and for this conversation to me is that yeah. the translation committee, instead of saying this is a dress, even just not just a dress, not even robe, but just dress. No, they actually reverted and and said we're not certain in both cases. So they changed the other one to go back to yes. <laughs> this is why I can't stand this stuff, man. So yeah, so right. So I, I just had someone ask me today, what's the best English translation to read? And I'm like, there isn't one. Like, I don't know what to tell you on that. You, you, you kind of got to like do your own. Language. It's just yeah. hard. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. So there's all yeah. kinds of bias, very active in biblical scholarship of all kinds. Uh, it's whether really it's refreshing to hear you say this stuff because like I'm not I, – I wonder if I – is it just me that I'm seeing this stuff? No. Well, am I, am, I, am I being biased against them? But – it is the case that a it lot is. of this stuff it has some there's some dogmas that are uh, present in scholarship. Correct. And I would say that's that's true whether it's being written for an academic audience or for general. So even some of these really great guys I've learned a lot from still have like without being aware of it, you know, might still have like a sexist bias without being aware of it, right? Or you know what I mean? So everybody has them. <laughs> the question is yeah. to what extent are you aware of them? <laughs> And anyway, so. No, that's a good point. Now, I don't know if we finished on what we were saying about Jesus before we go on to the Unix thing. Did you finish that off? I think we were so, supposed to what you said. So, right. I think I said it, but it'd be nice if I could just say it again, just so yeah. everybody knows. Like, so I think so it's not too much off. Yeah. Yeah. Like, again, just this is new. I, I, I want to be really clear. I have not seen anyone else publish saying this. And this is what's so stunning to me. Okay. Because this is my been my focus for the last 12 years or so. Let's be honest about what's being said here. So when Jesus says the problem with divorce is that you're going to remarry and thus commit adultery against your first spouse, that is putting sex at the center. Sex is the defining thing here. That is saying that marriage is about sex, that sex is about marriage. No wonder so many people today have a hard time thinking about marriage beyond what kind of sex is going to be engaged in, right? Jesus and Paul do not speak positively about marriage. And here, when he kind of protects marriage a little bit, Jesus is still putting, putting the framework for the marriage, the reason it's a problem is all about sex. And I, you know, every single person I talk to about this that I know is married or in a long term partnership, like I like to ask them, like, what are the top five things that make a marriage a marriage? And it's about shared resources and being there for each other and, da, 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 you know, the community, all the things. And sure, sex is a part of it, but it's not the defining thing. Mm -mm. So when we trust Jesus on this, we are or for people who do that, they are not really being taught to think through the implications here. People know or believe that it's a sin to divorce because Jesus said so right here, but they're not also then realizing what they're saying about sex. And Neil, I have to say that this was true for myself and it's true for so many students I've had that initially, at least for myself, that this is so deeply ingrained for so many people that I have a hard time getting them to talk about sex apart from marriage. Right. And to talk about marriage apart from what is the sex that's going to be engaged in, right? That it is so difficult for people. Well, Jesus is doing it here. 
for us. You know, he's a role model for us on that. Like, and I find that really problematic. <laughs> yeah. But let's be clear about that. He was well trained by his scriptures to do that. Like that's the that's what he inherited. Wow. Okay. <laughs> that's a, a lot of really good points being made here. Thank you. I want to know: Does Paul change before we? I want to really want to talk about the Unix thing. But, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> does Paul change? Does, does Paul stray from Jesus in any way about this? Well, I do think it's. I do think that the Paul's letters came before any of the Gospels. So I sure. think that's. So yes, uh, yes, and no. Um, I think that uh, Paul also does not speak positively in any place about marriage. And the one time, yeah, like the one time he's engaging something around marriage, it's in First Corinthians 7. Also, the issue of people having sex with sex workers and how that's a problem. But that's to me, that's not actually him talking about marriage. He's talking about people's activities. But marriage, right, in First Corinthians 7, the... Um, Lots of English trans, well, lots of translations I've looked at will have headings to chapters or sections, and most, and it's really funny to look at some of the headings for First Corinthians seven. Several will say something like advice on marriage, um, something or other about marriage, marriage, marriage advice, and I'm like, this isn't marriage advice. This is sex advice, and it's being given by a guy who claims to be celibate. So that's right. weird, right? But he's talking about, you know, the premise is it's better for a man not to touch a woman historically speaking and in context the issue is married couples wondering if, if they are holier if they abstain and again i know you're well versed in all of this in terms of the stoics and the the different you know greco-roman philosophies that encourage um self-control right? right and and this issue of having passions is a problem for some of these folks right and so yeah there were movements of the the fact the act of having sex was was looked down upon even if you were married it's right? the heart of the middle platonist in general it's like it's at the core the self-control totally. the yeah the opposition to um this like the orgiest orgiastic religions right. that are as around. if it's all or nothing but yes <laughs> right, right right which is like by the way and, and, and it's like that gets misinterpreted because a lot of these religions do talk about being um pious and having control mm -hmm. but they also have like religious ceremonies that involve mm -hmm. that stuff so it's really mm -hmm. like misinterpreted but 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 like you're saying paul is sort of um uh presenting what the middle platonist worldview is at the time mm -hmm. like, yeah he is and that whole chapter is like he's kind of deliberating all the different possibilities he could imagine that community that people in the Corinthian communities might be experiencing or whatever. And so he's kind of like, well, and for these people, I would recommend this. And for these people, I'm, the Lord says not I this and that, da, da, da. you know, and it's all about whether or not having sex within is okay or getting married in order to have sex is okay and all that kind of stuff. And so it's again, so the only time Paul even comes close to talking about marriages in the genuine Paul talking about this human relationship is focused on the issue of sex and whether or not a couple can or should have it. I mean, no wonder so many Christians, right, have this issue. Yeah. Now, Jesus, go ahead. Say, say what you're saying. Well, you, you were asking if if Paul and Jesus differ on the thing about marriage, and I think that. Um, they are relatively similar in terms of their in terms of their reflecting um, Hebrew Bible ideas, but Paul is also engaging this much more strict, um, preferring the self control of the passions idea that we don't necessarily see um, in from Jesus. But the question about what does Jesus mean when he brings up eunuchs in this context is a, is an interesting question and. I don't have an answer to that, but I'd love to talk about the passage if you want to talk about the passage. Yeah, well, it almost <laughs> sounds like to me, and I want to know what you think too, mm -hmm. that Jesus is saying to show how divorced you are, I'm using that, I don't know if I should use okay. that word, but okay. divorced you are from the fleshly desires of this world. Instead of doing, like, go beyond marriage, go beyond control, cut it off, become a mm. eunuch of heaven. Mm. Oh, I see that. I see what you mean. Some people have tried to look at the Addis religion, the Kybali Addis religion, so and believe. wonder wonder if there's some sort of that priesthood being over in that region in the Eastern mm -hmm. world, like Phrygia, Syria. 
where the they're very popular and there's they have a hilaria hilaria festival in the spring equinox time um but they don't i don't know if they're doing it for i don't i'm not sure if their reasons for doing it is for um controlling their bodies i don't think there's more of like a dedicating to themselves to the great mother which i guess they're, <laughs> they're similar in that right they're both doing it for dedication and for mm -hmm. initiation but jesus sounds like he's saying if you can't control because he in other passages he says if, if your if your right eye leads you to, to sin cut out cut it out you're right cut, cut, just like if your body's causing you to do any of these sins cut the part off mm -hmm. so the idea of a eunuch becoming a eunuch for the sake of the kingdom of heaven mm -hmm. sounds like it's saying that the highest thing you can do above marriage is to be completely celibate and also to cut it off. I would agree with part of that. Uh, the the I like what you're saying there in terms of cutting it off, like entire, like don't even, yeah, like it's not just that it's better not to marry to begin with, but like don't even don't even make it a possibility. <laughs> None of these things a possibility. But I do not believe, and I have had some pushback, and I, I love, I'm fine with pushback. I've had some people suggest that I'm missing the point here. But I don't think Jesus is referencing a eunuch has anything to do with celibacy. Because we have very well documented <laughs> um, anecdotes and summaries of characterizations of eunuchs, and they're, they were in his in the his in the ancient world they were well known to be adept sexually with men and women right so and by the way, with the um with the addis cult to go back to that for one second before i, I just want to jump this photos in there they they're the the uh ritual if you were watching the ritual you had an obligation to give the, the newly castrated priest women's clothing hmm. mm -hmm. that says something it's not just about being a eunuch and not. It's about so there's a there's a transition happening. There is definitely a transition happening. Because why, why, why would women's clothing even matter if it's right. just if it's just about castrating and it's no, it's it's more than that. That that says something about the initiative. So, to, and I, the reason why I brought that up, not to cut you off, but I'm I'm adding to it. Your point is like the way eunuchs are perceived in the ancient world is that sort of right. Well, actually. It, the, the, so yes, somewhat effeminized, but also there are there's a, there's at least one reference to calling them a third gender, like that's in the Latin. Um, there's an article that is because because of how important this content is and the primary sources are on this. I haven't read all of the primary sources, but I do have an article linked on my website on the podcasts tab. Um, the um, uni Unix and the post gender Jesus. Um, because it's really important. The the I've had so many people say, no, when Jesus referenced eunuchs, he's talking about celibacy. I'm like, yeah, that doesn't make any sense in the first century context. It means absolutely no sense. What is true, by the way, is that bishops in the fourth century made a clear shift to making to claiming that, that this is a reference to celibacy. But in the first century, whether or not Jesus said it, I don't care. In the first century, there's no one who's gonna believe that calling some that someone being a eunuch means that they are celibate. Were some of them? Sure. Right. <laughs> but that is not what so I do like your point though, Neil, and it's something I'm gonna mull over. That this is what if I look through look at this through that ratcheted up lens of what Jesus is doing, known for doing in the book of Matthew. I think that's that makes a lot of sense. But you know, from a this century <laughs> Biblical scholar who cares about people saying that they are followers of Jesus, but they don't pay any attention to this. I think it's important to raise what you did, which is in particular when you castrate a man after puberty, right? There are going to be some things about him that, uh, well, I mean, it depends on what things are different if you castrate prior to puberty or after. So men castrate after puberty can still get an erection. And, and also, sex is more than just penis and vagina. So even if they can't, there's still sex they can be having without, you know, it's just rude. Um, so this idea of a person now being a form of like a transition, They're, they are now a changed body and they are perceived as different. They are perceived as being 
both male and female or neither. And that part I think is really important for us today. The other is this belief that Jesus is commanding or suggesting that celibacy is part of that. And I, I, I cannot overemphasize how wrong I think that is and is well, I do also believe it's well intended. I believe that people are really uncomfortable when it talk, comes to sex and don't have very good frameworks for talking about it then or now. And that the church itself, the tradition, the traditions of the church have, have been written by people like Paul and Augustine who had issues with sex. So there are many layers of really negative misunderstandings about bodies and sexuality that play into the need for that to be about celibacy when I don't think it was initially. You know, the other, and this brings us back to what we talked about in the beginning with Adam being androgynous. It almost <laughs> sounds like there's another interpretation that could be said here that doing this brings you back to your sinless state of being like Adam. You're androgynous now. That's an I'm interesting just, suggestion. Just, thought, just popped in my head. Like, I don't know how much if anyone's even suggested that, but like, as we were talking about in the beginning, mm -hmm. but then there's the idea of Addis castrating and becoming godlike. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, maybe this idea in the time period was floating around there. Yes. I would say that, um, you know, Jews don't have a big, don't make a big deal out of Genesis three and this idea of original sin that Christians do that's Jews being do. read, right. That's being read into it. And that is not at all what I would assume that Jesus would be thinking. Um, about Genesis two or three, um, Genesis two is the the creation of that the human and then the partner and then the we have male and female and now we've got them getting pairing up and Genesis three is where you get the encounter with the the serpent and eating the fruit oh. that's forbidden and all that. So I don't oh. think that Jesus just so unclear. I don't think Jesus would think of that as being about sin the way Christians right. do. But the people writing the Gospels aren't Jesus. Oh, that's they're, true. They're writing in Greek. For the Greek, greater Greek world, people living in Phrygia, Asia Minor, places where Addis worship was taking place. Sure, sure, sure. So these people and their and what they think about it's, we're, we, that, I think that could be a factor, right? Yes, but so I'll have to think about what you're suggesting because um, because uh, let me, let me you, say it like that. the you, uh, the people writing the Gospels are writing it in Greek probably for mostly Greek audience and um, they're, however they interpret sin and the idea of what castration would mean probably would have to go through that filter. Yes and no. And again, that's because the, the gospel of Matthew is for a Jewish audience. Yes. Greek speaking, but still predominantly Jewish. So I think, and yes, there are influences, Greek and Roman influences, for sure, on their own thoughts. But I would, I, I want to be really careful about saying that all four Gospels were written for a Greek audience. I do think they were written, you know, Mark was written, for, you know, like, I think that they had different intentions and different audiences. I just want to be careful right. about overgeneralizing, I guess. Um, sure. I, I agree with that. Okay. Um Matthew, sure, is it's for a Jewish audience. <laughs> it's trying to convince Jews beyond this sect of Judaism that is that is worshiping Jesus as the Christ to I've get on board with that. And I've recently um, pointed this out in my, one of my last videos that around the time of Antiochus the Third, not Antiochus the Fourth, that everyone, the, not the evil one, not the one before that, he's called the Great Antiochus Magnus the Third. Well, he fought against the Romans and lost big giant war for the Mediterranean. Whoever would have won this war would have been hmm. the, the, the hegemon of the Mediterranean. He gave up all of his naval ships to Rome. This happened in 194 BCE. As a result of that, and that this is, this is going to make sense why I'm saying this. As a result of that, he gave up 2 million Jewish refugees that relocated them from Judea into Asia Minor, and even in some places in Thrace and Greece. Two million, that's what it says. And maybe I don't know if it's... Yeah, maybe I'm going to raise a question about numbers, but yeah. Regardless of the numbers, it doesn't matter. If they're, if they're saying two million, there must have been a lot, even if it's 100,000. Right, exactly. Okay. Yeah. But the point is, this is happening two centuries, wait, more than that, almost three centuries before Matthew's being written, mm -hmm. which means 
throughout those centuries, you have Jewish people living in these regions. Oh, sure. And, and so, yes, Matthew is for a, a Jewish audience, 100 percent. But it's written for these. I think it's written for these people living in these Greek areas who are speaking in Greek and writing because they're not. If it's right, if it's written for people in Jerusalem, it would be in Hebrew. But it's written for Greek speaking no. Jewish people, right? Okay. Yeah. No. I mean, yes. I always want to be really careful about some of these claims that we're it's, no. It's, it, 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 it's a, we're getting into the weeds here. But what well, I'm saying, I guess, what I'm saying is, yes, Matthew is very has that Jewish attitude it's for jewish people but what i'm what i'm saying is what are the people what are, who are these greek-speaking hellenized jews and what are their thoughts are in this time period rather than thinking about it through like an old testament uh 900 bc lens or whatever the hell like i'm just throwing i'm saying this is a different time period and i don't know maybe the, maybe there's some mixing going on is what oh, i'm saying i absolutely think you're right about the mixing and about the influence the greek culture its influence on ideas but because you do have the magi showing up in matthew and like that's not i mean magi is that's that's not jewish like but i mean i'm just saying like so i i, I don't know why am i even saying this I mean, what i'm saying is i think there's more than just the jewish aspect of it that's all sure yeah right yeah it's so complicated because it's it we're is. putting these ideas in jesus's mouth I'm and, just throwing, yeah, I'm just throwing stuff and seeing. I understand. I, mean, I, I yeah. understand that I'm not like going to be. But right the farther about. we get from a specifically Jewish audience, the less likely it is that that the reference to Unix has to do with celibacy. Is my point. That's a really good point. And that's and that's what I care about in terms of people today. And people today insist that it is about celibacy. And I'm like, nope. You know where that came from? <laughs> that came from the fact that. There were so many men in the early church who were castrating themselves, having themselves castrated, that by the time of the first ecumenical council, which was in the year 325, which was called by the emperor, by the way, it was not called by a leader in the church. It was called by the emperor who was afraid his empire was going to split over these arguing Christians. The very first of at least 20 decisions they made was to say, if you have had yourself castrated, you cannot be a leader in the church. Wow. It had gotten that out of hand. <laughs> That's how serious this is, though. Exactly. They were taking it literally. Origin. Origin is known as one of the great church fathers. He's seen that way, yeah. He, he castrated himself for yeah. the sake of the hev kingdom of heaven for yeah. whatever reason, whatever reasons he had. Right. So I think you're right. I think it's beyond celibacy. I think there's some cultural stuff happening there. Yeah. And why would, you know, but your, your suggestion is a good one in terms of why at this point, the reference to eunuchs would be brought in, right? In wh why in reference to talking about divorce and marriage, is this even going to come in to play? But, you know, again, from my perspective, historically speaking, um, like wider Mediterranean world speaking, eunuchs were believed to be they were t i mean the the passage in the book about this is just really i mean it's just really they're they're well known enough and their presence is significant enough that we have all kinds of aphorisms and sayings and generalizations about eunuchs but being celibate is not one of them <laughs> right so today we we have words that are in jesus's mouth where he is saying, he's embracing, he's acknowledging these body, these humans, these bodies as possible for the kingdom of, the, of heaven. And they are both sexually active with men and women and also talked about as non-binary. Non like, can we just talk about that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Beyond I, just heterosex I, and non-binary. Yeah. Like, but, we're not taking this seriously. That's the thing. People who follow well, Jesus are not taking this seriously. So I, I don't know how much you've read in some of the Gnostic stuff. The heart, the I try to stay away from it. <laughs> I, know, I, I hear that a lot. I like from, Gnostic stuff. <laughs> I hear that a lot from uh, from people, but um, but yeah. I think, especially like reading some of the Carpocratian texts, Valentinian stuff, whatever, Sethians. These are early Christians. They're not calling themselves Gnostics. They're calling themselves Christians. These right, right. Christians. There's but, debate whether we should actually do away with the ti the title Gnostic. Go ahead. I think you should, when, especially with these particular people. They're calling themselves Christians. They're never calling themselves Gnostics. It's only until the late second century where people start calling them Gnostics. And they're gone by then. 
They're mm-hmm. not even there to defend themselves. They're gone. Carpal creations, for example, are following the Bible. They're following acts about giving up all your possessions and living communal lifestyles where everyone's equal and no one has need of anything. And then they have texts about equality. There's a text called On Justice written by Epiphanius, or Epiphanes, not Epiphanius, who's the son of Marcelina, great church leader, Marcelina, woman church leader, was a huge deal. She was married to Carpocrates, and they had a child named Epiphanes who wrote this amazing, brilliant, this this kid was a wonder child. He was a genius if he did write this. And it's an amazing text about justice and equality. Hmm. And it but by it really makes you think these Christians early on were a lot different than the later Roman church Christians become. And there was a lot more progressivism, a lot more like they were living like Kloppenborg points this out. They had unions, trade unions. That's <laughs> that's a left that's a big thing. deal. Yeah, that's like it's a Democrat today vote for un- unions, vote for Democrat. Like a, what I'm saying is, and not to get political, but I'm just saying. Early on, the evidence suggests that these Christians were sort of pushing against the um, hierarchical structure of the Roman imperial cult. Caesar's on top. He's God. Mm -hmm. And then underneath Caesar, you have these hierarchical, you have the patrician class, you have the equestrian class, all the way down to the plebs who are nothing. They don't even have a name. They have their first name of, my name is um, Peter of Samaria. That's Mm -hmm. it. Mm-hmm. But out on the patrician class, you have Gaius, Julius, Caesar, the third, right. Magnus. Yeah. They have 10 names. Totally. We see, Mag- we see similar things today, by the way, but yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and what I'm getting at, there's a yeah. hierarchical structure totally. happening yeah. in the Roman Imperial cult. Christians come along and say, and by the way, the reason why I brought up Epiphanes' text, he says there is no male or female. He says that in this text, there is no such thing as male or female. I almost want to pull it up. Do you want to see it real quick? Sure. All right. This, yeah, this is so. This is a fragment. We lost the original text, Epiphanius on justice, on righteousness, the same word. Right. right. And he's saying it's found in Clement. Clement, Clement of Alexandria Clement is writing cites, these things and is referencing yeah. these ideas. He cites this whole thing. Okay. The righteousness of God is a kind of sharing along with equality. Man, right off the bat, we're talking about equality. There is equality in the heaven, which is stretched out in all directions. It contains the entire earth in its circle. The night reveals all the stars equally. The light of the sun, which is the cause of daytime and the father of light, God pours out from above upon the earth in equal measure to all people who have power to see. For all see alike, since here is no distinction between rich and poor. A Roman imperial call would never say this. Mm-hmm. People and governor, are you kidding me? Caesar's mm-hmm. way different than the people. Right. Stupid and clever. <laughs> female and male. No difference between mm-hmm. female and male. Free men and slaves, mm-hmm. even irrational animals, are not accorded any different treatment. But in just the same way, God pours out from sunlight equally upon all the animals. He establishes his justice to both good and bad by seeing that none is able to get more than his share and to deprive his neighbor so that he has twice the light his neighbor has. It is a, stun- it is a strikingly, yeah. What it's we very can- egalitarian. And look, yeah. at he did not make a distinction. Between male and female. It's that's pretty, what he says. Un- pretty, pretty atypical. Yeah. Yeah. And, but, and that's what I'm saying. Some, and these are the heretics. Right. right. Why are those the heretics? Why could right. that could have been? Imagine if they became the, the Orthodox. Wouldn't that have been lovely? Imagine the world today. Yeah. If Carpocratians became the Orthodoxy. Yeah. Imagine that. that. Imagine that being a central message to Christianity. There's a moral, doesn't matter who you are. That could have been a big deal. Well, I would suggest that there are elements, not consistently, but there are elements in the genuine Paul that direct in that point in that direction. And that is a that was perceived as a threat to political stability. The trying to actually live according to no male or female, no slave or free, no Greek or Jew is pauline yeah it is it's early pauline it's not it's not pauline as a whole it is yeah, early because, pauline because you get those texts like timothy who and i tried bringing this up Directly to my orthodox friends. i tried yeah. bringing this to my orthodox friends go timothy was not written by paul 
says who? Yeah. I watched that with your scholars. Why shouldn't I? And I'm, and I'm just like, That's a typical response for we, a conservative. If we look at what it says in Timothy, compare yeah. it to what Paul says in Car uh, Corinthians, it's someone else. Galatia, yeah. You have a whole different message being portrayed here. All of a sudden, we care about bishops? I thought the world was going to end in two days. Why do yeah. we care about bishops? I mean, that, right. No, that's true. That's a, yeah, all of it. The, yeah. right. And the, the, the introduction of the household codes in the later in the Deuteropauline letters is is an indication that the the equality or the at least striving for it in the genuine Paul took root and became problematic, right? Um, yeah, there are two other there are two thoughts I have about this. They're, they're kind of disparate here. One is this is I do I've taken people on a kind of a footsteps of Paul trip in the past, and visiting the the ancient site of Ephesus is my favorite beyond all things because of how so many pieces of this conversation come together in the town of Ephesus. The other thing I want to say is to derail this piece and go back to one other thing about what's attributed to Jesus that I didn't make clear. Can I do that, Neil? Yeah, of course. Um, here's the thing. So remember when we were, I, I was saying, reference the four passages that people say this is this defines biblical marriage, right? These four verses, you know, Genesis 1, 28, 2, 24, blah, 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 right? Well, when you read the full context of instead of just Matthew 19, 4 to 6, but if you read what Jesus is introducing or saying, he is read, you know, he is also he's confirming that women are property, objects of men, but he's also saying, cut those balls off for the sake of the kingdom, which directly challenges Genesis 1 28, be fruitful and multiply. Does it not? I've been made I've made this argument that Jesus is more of an antichrist than a Christ. <laughs> He's definitely not family friendly. That's he's not family values guy at he's, all. He flips things on their head. Well, he the does. idea, he of, the idea of you just you just named a really good one. I didn't even think about that. That is flipping be fruitful up on its head. Right. Right. Another one and, is um is uh the eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth thing. He flips that on its head. Or what happens if your animal gets caught in a, a ditch on Sabbath? He flips that on its head. He's flipping things on their head sometimes. Mm -hmm. Or turning them sideways. I don't know. I think or some sideways. of them are just more like, maybe hey, not, let's maybe do not 90 degrees. Maybe yeah, like I mean, I, I, I say that because I think it's uh, he's redirecting at times um, sure. is my my assessment. But, you know, anyway, so Jesus on marriage is um, not taken seriously is definitely one of the takeaways for me from writing this book on marriage in the Bible. And I wish that people would take it seriously or perhaps why why when we talk when someone wants to point to matthew 19 4 to 6 why aren't they also including including the next six verses and taking that very seriously since that's the thing jesus brings to the table like can we talk about that please and get serious about it instead of pretending it's not in there right it's a good point it's well it's well said it's well and you dem you really dig into it in the book and lay out the arguments and demonstrate everything using what the text says that's my yeah. That's which my is un, undefeatable. If you can do it's whatever the text says is, is trumps everything else. Whatever, however you interpret it or however you translate it, the text is what it, is the text, and the text has its original context that sometimes can only be understood if you know the language. Yeah, that's right? the problem. Is this translation bit that we were talking about before? Yeah, and how we're not even aware we're being misled by the translation that we happen to be reading because we're trusting, right? We're trusting the person, the people who gave it to us to be honest with it. But the fact that there are over 50 English translations of the same set of <laughs> same set of texts ought to make a lot of people pause, right? Like in terms of the definitiveness that we give, that some people are taught to give scripture. Yeah. And this is a lot, a lot of times the Orthodox people will say this, this is why Protestants was such a huge problem. It ruined everything. Well, it's like, that's one way to look at it. If you want to just accept the church is correct, no matter what, which we know they're not because they, they fought against heliocentrism. They fought against round earth. They fought against all these things over time. So they're mm -hmm. wrong. You mm -hmm. know, they're legitimately wrong. They predicted that, that all these different um, saints from the early couple centuries predicted end dates that all came in pass. Mm -hmm. So they're wrong. And we know they're wrong objectively. Mm -hmm. Not even simply. We know true or false. Were they wrong about stuff? The answer is true. Yes, they were. They were wrong. So we know they can be wrong. So it's like, all right, now once you establish that the church can be wrong, and now it's like, what are the Protestants saying? Well, they're saying a million different things. Right. 
which means they're interpreting the text a million different ways. Exactly. Probably have a million different Protestant churches. Yep. That should make you stop and say, what's I going mean, on? It is the least unified of the religious traditions on the planet. <laughs> is the one that specifically said they wanted, that the leader said, uh, you know, our father is calling us to unity. <laughs> I don't think that I haven't read all of the ancient religious texts, but I don't think that there are that many texts that make the specific claim about unity for this tradition. You know, like, yeah, yeah. Being, you know, you're allowed, especially like in the ancient Greek world, you're there was a lot of differences and no one cared. Right. Like you could tell the same mythology story with and then like tweak certain parts at the end or change. Take one like Hephaestus sometimes gets swapped out with Prometheus or. And mm -hmm. some stories, mm -hmm. this guy, yeah. some stories, this right. guy—they don't care. It's not They're the not thing. About that. It's, it's more about the. It's more about the rituals and community. About uh, yeah, the agreed. Yeah, what is how, how does this story help us understand things or yeah. make sense of it? Mm -hmm. But anyways, you got to get the book. The links in the description. <laughs> Marriage in the Bible. It's really good. She lays out these amazing points about what the book actually says and how we're misinterpreting this stuff. It's all about what the text says. Get to the text. This is what we love on this channel. And um, anything else coming up that you want to promote? Or you got your YouTube channel. Obviously, I got a link for that in the, in the description Thank as well. Thank you. Yeah, I actually just started doing... So I do a weekly live stream where I'm interview. I'm starting to interview some scholars. I'm also just continuing with my um, story time. So I just engage a biblical passage and talk about it with my kind of no-holds-barred commentary. Um so it goes back and forth. But what I've just started recently, which is I'm excited about, is doing a live conversation. So I send out a Zoom link to anyone who's supporting me through Patreon. And we do it. It's the third Thursday of the month at 8 p.m. Eastern, which I know is not ideal. But it's something. We're starting there. We'll see how it goes. And that's that was actually really fun. We just started this month. Um, so I'm excited about doing that. See how that, you know, that's what awesome. that leads to. Yeah. I'll put a link for that in the description. Thanks. And um, thank you for coming on. This has been thank great. You. I think we talked touched a lot on a lot of stuff and it was a really good conversation and we'll do this again soon. All right. And you have ascertained true gnosis.